what we have done with SEVEDS through this, these first several months is really under, come to understand we need a sense of urgency. We all need to understand that this is an urgent problem, a problem that needs an urgent response. Not necessarily fast, but urgent, that we need to start paying attention to this now, that, we, that low wages and rising costs of living and limited job opportunities create a disconnect between skills needed by employers and the skills held by the workforce. This is not sustainable. This is not going to allow our economy to grow. This leads to a widely shared sense of economic insecurity in a large pop population, resulting in many Mo Vermonters looking for economic opportunity elsewhere and choosing Vermont as a place to live and, and, and few choosing from on this place to live and connect with business. It may be helpful for Frank and for everyone in the room. And then we have developed through SEVEDS a vision statement for SEVEDS, a, a, a vision. Southeastern Vermont will have an economy that generates long-term growth and prosperity and that improves our quality of life and sustains our quality of place. That's what we're about. That's what this whole process is about. Within that, we've created a set of objectives, goals that we want to reach by 2017. You can read those there. I won't go through them. But those are measures, uh, those are the goals that, that we're going to be pursuing over these next years, months, weeks, months, years. And we will have this. This is up on the website presently, the SEVIDS website. And then these are the metrics. These are the measures that we are seeking to obtain that we want to, for example, see population growth, or, or at least minimize population decline, at least maintain population. We want to see growth in the number of people employed. We want to see growth in wages and in net income. You'll see them there. These are, the, these are our objectives, goals, and specific measures to make between now and 2017. So as with any good planning process, you need a vision, you need a mission, you need goals and measures. So with that, I'd like to just do a really quick introduction, if we could just say, who are we here, who are we, where are we from, and if you represent an organization, throw that in as well. So, let me start over here. Cynthia Stoddard, I'm the town manager for the town of Huntington. Amy Buckley, town administrator of Huntington. Lister Town of Rocky. And your name, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Camilla Roberts. Great, Camilla. Um, Kathleen Hacker, citizen, Bellas Falls. Sue Fillion, I'm a planner with the town of Brattleboro. Great. I will come up here. Denise Mason, director of economic development, Sevka. Gary Fox, director of Sustainable Valley Group, uh, Bellas Falls, resident. And Guy Payne, director of the Southeastern Vermont Outreach Net Network, living in Rockingham, or Sackett's River. So back to you, Jeff. Jeff Lewis, BDCC. Tom Consolino, Wilmington. Great. Doug Paul, development director of the town of Rockingham. Anthony Summers, uh, Flood Recovery Officer with the BDCC. Chris Moore, Bellows Falls Attorney. Jill James, I work for Chroma Technology and I'm a SEPEDS board member. Katie Dearborn, I'm a resident in Westminster and I'm also the president of the Bellows Falls Downtown Development Alliance. Uh, Catherine Kabatsky, I work nowadays and I'm part of the uh, Vista Promotions Committee and president of the chamber. Olga Peters, I write for the Commons. Chad Simmons, I'm with the Greater Falls Prevention Coalition. Uh, Michelle Sacco, I'm a case manager with Youth Services here in Bellows Falls. I'm Bianca Bayer, Youth Development Director at Youth Services. Laura Stone, uh, Wyatt Andrews, uh, a Mondo videographer with Mondo Media Works. And I'm now going to turn the podium, if you will, over to Frank Knott, who is from Vital Economy and working with us on our Conference of Economic Development Strategy to take us through the rest of the morning. Thank, Thank you, Frank. Very much, Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You all may need more what were that sugar and caffeine. <laughs> the, uh, Okay, we've got a good amount. How many of you were at the Brattleboro Retreat meeting that we did to launch the, uh, this new strategy? One, two, three, four. Okay, so most of you weren't at that meeting. This is, for those of you, there's going to be a little repeat around that. Uh, most people don't seem to mind that because there's so much in here that you, it takes a few times to even grapple with it. We're going to change the format a little bit um, just to keep it interesting and to engage you all in more questions because there was a major overview for that large audience the last time 
and we want to make sure that we get uh, uh, some solid input into the process. For those of you who have not met me before, uh, Vital Economy was involved in helping to put the original SEVED strategy together uh, about a year and a half ago. And is that right, Jeff? A year and a half? Two years ago? Two years ago. And <clears throat> uh, we were sponsored by Fairpoint Communication Services came in, and then we were recently selected to help put together what's called the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Uh, and we'll try to prevent from using a lot of acronyms. Uh, unfortunately, in economic development, there are tons of them. And the approach today will be, first of all, we're going to give you what we call Economics 101. Uh, basics around how an economy works today uh, and, and what you need to do in terms of planning. Then we're going to go into a regional profile. Come on in and sit down. And just introduce yourself as you come in. Adam Medeiros. Oh, John. Okay. Did you Jesse just? Jesse Coram. Pardon? Jesse Coram. Okay, nice to meet you, Jesse. Okay. The regional profile is we're going to just overview not all the slides that are here, but what we think are the key ones for you all to have an understanding of what does the data really tell us about the region as a whole. And <clears throat> In each of these sections, we're going to spend some time with Q&A, asking you some questions and hopefully getting input. And Pat's going to be recording your input. And the video is also going to be recording it. And the purpose for that is to make sure we're capturing your input that, that can influence the plan uh, that's being developed. The, <clears throat> then we'll go to break, which is mean any of you have, 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 and break will be roughly around uh, 10 o'clock. So anybody that needs to move their car to a safe place. Um, I don't know, Dutch, is it legal to move from one two-hour slot to another two-hour slot? That is, that is okay. So you don't have to go all the way down to uh, and back, down by the railroad station. Uh, then after the break, we're going to explore some issues, a challenge, and opportunity that were identified uh, through this process get some additional input from you. And because we're up here, we're doing this in four different regions of uh, the Wyndham region, so that we're getting some input uh, from each of the local areas. So we're expecting that we're going to hear some different things here than we would hear in uh, Brattleboro, for instance, uh, or London there. Uh, then we're going to discuss what does quality of place mean in the context of uh, what does quality of place mean in the context of a healthy south southeastern Vermont economy? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how important quality of place is today and how much more people in economic development need to focus on quality of place as part of an economic strategy. Uh, and then we'll end with giving you a sense of what's going to happen between now and uh, the fall, uh, the various input areas. So anybody have any questions before we get started? Um, any comments or questions that you did? Any questions about the strategy slides that Pat had gotten up there or the metrics or how they were developed or anything? OK, then we'll go ahead and uh, get started. The, um, OK. <clears throat> One of the first things I want to start talking about is something called SMART. Uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-based. Okay, those are what are called SMART goals. SMART goals have been, anybody ever hear of SMART goals? Mm -hmm. Okay, those of you in business and stuff may be familiar with them. Okay. <clears throat> For some unknown reason, uh, we seem to be one of the few economic development consulting firms in the country that know what a SMART goal is. Uh, I think it's mainly because all of us are former CEOs. Uh, and we use them in our businesses. We also look, this whole strategy that's being developed is centered around a balanced approach that says that we're going to concentrate on economic resilience, human capacity development, and quality of place. All of it's surrounded by innovation and entrepreneurship. So that's sort of the way the said strategy is going to, that comprehensive economic development strategy is being developed around that, through that lens, okay? And what I'd like to ask you at this point is, everybody here is pretty much from this area of the region, or are you all mostly? Oh, 
in Massachusetts, that's okay. okay. But you work here? <laughs> okay. The, um, we understand that you're part of the labor shed. The, uh, okay, is the economy in this region different today than it was 50 years ago, and is that good or bad? Don't all answer at once. It's, it's not that much different. We've lost a lot of the precision machine tool companies, okay. but it's not that much different. So we've lost a lot of, so we've, we've got less, less, fewer jobs in those traditional industries. Mm -hmm. Have there been, ha, is there anything, I notice that there are a lot of buildings that are not as occupied as they used to be. Is that right? Is that pretty predominant? Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. Bad, okay. <coughs> So, uh, how many of you here are in business at all, or how many of you in the how many in the nonprofit sector? Okay, the do you all need to do planning in order to be successful? Okay, we often get a question: Why the, don't economies just happen? Uh, actually, they don't. Yes, there are economies that happen. Usually, they're pretty screwed up. Okay, the economies that do well are the ones that are planned. People actually have an intentional direction they're trying to go into. Uh, unfortunately, about 90% of the regions of this country don't have an intentional economic plan. Uh, and, and this state, until Pat, I think this state until recently, didn't, never had a comprehensive economic development strategy, which is not unusual. Uh, and this is the first locally based economic strategy, I think, in this region, correct? And one of the few in the, the first SEDs in the state? Well, no, there's a couple other SEDs in the state, and there's, that, but the process is not as comprehensive. The as process isn't here. as comprehensive. Right. This, so <clears throat> this process we're going to go through and that you're participating in is basically going to take a business approach to creating a strategy. It's going to use, it's going to do, it's doing extensive research on trying to understand what the, yes, sir? I didn't mean to interrupt Go ahead. I think we want to say something about um, change over the last 50 years. Um, the loss of the manufacturing jobs is tremendous and enormous. I mean, I have had people in Springfield, I used to work there, uh, tell me that 8,500 jobs uh, went away just in Springfield. Right. Jobs were lost in Windsor, jobs were lost in departure of paper mills. And all that money was available. People had that money to spend, and they probably used to spend most of it here in Vermont. But in the past 50 years, New Hampshire is doing a very successful job of making New Hampshire the shopping area around than Vermont. Right. So we earn less money here and spend more of it out, out away from here. Excellent point, and that's clearly what the data shows. And one of the things that we, we, we actually have some data that we're going to show you that validates that, John. And you're Ms. John Medeiros, right? Uh, and one of the problems with that, uh, and I'll show you, a, there's a slide in this section that talks about how an economy works. There's only three ways that, that an economy basically works, the way money is spent. And um, there are and one of the things that's happening that's actually happened to this area and happened to many areas has to do with this, what we call the P to C value chain. P is the producer, C is the consumer, and basically we're starting with the raw material over on the left side, your left side where the P is. The right side is the end point of purchase, which is the customer. That, those arrows in between are what's called a value chain. And in that value chain, there are a whole bunch of steps in the economy when you harvest out of the field, and that harvest gets processed, it gets packaged up into a food product or whatever, it gets distributed through a wholesaler, goes to a retailer, goes on a shelf, and ultimately a consumer purchases it. That value chain applies to all industries, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, whether it's oil. For the most, most of the industries, Oil is one of the few that this doesn't apply to. Two-thirds of all the profit in that value chain between P and C is in the last one-third closest to C. Think about a vegetable that grows in the field and goes into a packaged 
into a can or a package and gets bought on the shelf. How much does it get sold for when it comes out of the field and how much does it get sold for when it's on? I can assure you most of the profit is not at the CM. Most rural economies in this country, and Vital Economy specializes in working in rural economies, most rural economies, the businesses in those regions typically are closer to C than they are to P. And what has happened with the manufacturing sector throughout this country, because the manufacturing that was classically done in these areas was closer to C than to P, it wasn't as value-added. When you hear somebody talk about value-added manufacturing, it means there's three, four, or five steps further along the value chain from P that's getting them closer to C. And the further along, the closer you get to C, the more money you bring in the door to the company, the higher the value of the product or service is, the more profit margin there is, thereby more money can be used for wages. Okay, and you're paying high. Does that make sense? So the reason a lot of, there are certain areas of this country that did not suffer as much from manufacturing decline uh, overseas as others, and it's because they focused on moving up the value chain. They didn't keep, they didn't continue to manufacture at the same consumer base level or the commodity level as, as, as most regions did. Does that make sense? So you're cut, and, and one of the things you, anybody know how many manufacturing jobs have been lost in China in the last five years? 15 million. Okay, people say, oh, all the jobs are going to China. Guess what? China is now facing a problem because they, those, they have been doing a lot of commodity manufacturing. Guess what? Vietnam and Malaysia can do it, and Burma can do it cheaper than they can. So all, the ma all that's going on is companies are chasing the cheaper manufacturing dollar at the commodity end. But in the United States, we are projected to bring onshore about 5 million manufacturing jobs in the next 10 years. Mo almost all of those jobs are new value-added jobs, but they're at a very different level of the manufacturing cycle than the ones that left, okay? And one of the problems is we keep focusing on what happened in the past and say, let's bring the jobs back we used to have. We're not going to get those jobs. The jobs we want are the better jobs, the ones that are more value added, and the ones that give us uh, more niche and sustainable direction. So the trick in the vital economy world is close the gap between P and C. Let your region be expert at, at leveraging an indigenous resource to come get closer to C. Does that make sense? And bring more of the, 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 the total profit into your region. Okay. Now this gets to the point, John, that you were talking about. The swimming pool is your economy. The water in the swimming pool is capital. And there are three ways. The whole idea of an economy is you want to build a bigger swimming pool. Does that make sense? You want to get, you want the economy to grow. You have to bring in the remodeling contractor and extend the boundaries of the pool because there's more capital coming in, you have to contain all that water. First thing that happens in, um, is the consumer services sector. We're a 70% consumer driven economy, okay? 70% of our dollars throughout this economy in the United States is spent on consumption, which is one of the high, we are the highest consuming nation in the world. Um, that's not all good, I will tell you. Uh, in this, what happens here is the consumers are basically buying things, um, exchanging transactions between each other. Okay, they're going to the store, they're, buy they're taking the wages they've earned in the area, um, and they're buying things at the retail store, they're buying things at the grocery store. That type of activity is like a bunch of people on uh, Labor Day being in a swimming pool, splashing water all around, sun's beating down, water's going out on the side of the pool, the sun's beating down, evaporating water. What happens? The water level goes where? Down. So you're actually <coughs> decreasing the capital that's available in the, you know, you're not bringing in any more capital. The second thing that happens <coughs> is 
for those people that are buying clothes at the retailer, if those clothes aren't manufactured in this particular area, that retailer has to use money in this economy to go outside the economy to bring that good in to sell to you, right? What's happening to the water in the pool? It's going down. So between the first two, the economy loses capital, the pool size gets smaller, and you get a concussion when you hit the bottom of the pool. Okay? There's only one way to grow an economy, and it's through export. You either export a service, knowledge, or a good that is made here, produced here. So for instance, if you are Harvard, you are a huge export economy because you're bringing people in from all over the world to pay tuition that pays to professors that live in the area, but those aren't Massachusetts residents for the most part, right? So that's a net <coughs> increase in capital. So education can actually be a net importer of capital. Healthcare can be an importer of capital, but most healthcare organizations are not because they're serving the local community. So if you happen to be a specialty service like the Brattleboro Retreat or something like that, you can be a net. So the idea here is the only way that you can really grow your economy long term is you've got to develop an ability to create services, knowledge, products that can be exported to others. Yes, John? Tourism function that way. Tourism is absolutely an export economy because you're bringing people in from outside the region to, uh, to bring capital into the region. And typically, those tourists don't require fire departments and education and all those other things. So you actually use fewer of those dollars for public services than you do for others. So the, so the idea here is, and this money that's coming into the economy is called investment attraction. Now, with these two slides, the P2C slide and the swimming pool slide, you have now got an undergraduate degree in economics. Okay? If you can basically understand that we are in the business of filling the pool to bring more capital in, and we're in the business of getting closer to sea, does that give you a way to evaluate whether, whether the projects you're going to consider as priorities would do one of those? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the whole idea here. Yes, ma'am. I'm just wondering about the, the types of jobs you're talking about on the seaside, and if you could give some examples of that. <coughs> yeah, well, I, I'd say Chroma is, is a perfect example where they're making high-end um, uh, optical. Yeah, optical filters. And we actually don't have one. We have only one customer that's actually even in the state of Vermont, and it's right. a VM. So the kind of jobs, they are very high, 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 very precision engineering kinds of jobs that pay a considerable amount of money for those jobs. So that's an example of a job to see. Another example would be, let's just, this, uh, there's a lot of interest in Vermont and local foods. Okay, you can, you can take, um, you can do one of two things. You can grow string beans and sell them to a commodity as a commodity to be packaged in a can. Or you can grow organic string beans and market them directly to on a uh, farm to table strategy that goes directly to the restaurant. So for instance, in the Seattle area, we've done a major project on taking farms on the Olympic Peninsula and moving to organic crops to sell directly into the I-5 corridor, which is across the, the Puget Sound. So they're bringing money from the Seattle economy into the Olympic Peninsula economy, but they're doing it at the sea end instead of, you know, they're going right to the restaurant that's buying it, as opposed to going to the distributor that sells it to the wholesaler. And a classic example I'll give you on that particular project is we do a lot of asset mapping. We got all the farmers to asset map all the things that they grew and the, the, the um, animals that they, they, they raised and and what was interesting is we ran into a situation in a meeting where there was a berry processor that met a berry producer at the same meeting. They were four miles away from each other on the Olympic Peninsula. 
and you know the Olympic Peninsula, and there's mountains and stuff there, so sometimes you might know who's there. Turns out the berry processor was buying their berries from a berry wholesaler in Oregon who was buying the berries from the berry producer four miles down the road. Okay, so if you asset map, you can get closer to see just by finding out what resources you have in your region and linking them together. And that can be done in farming, it can be done in wood manufacturing. As a matter of fact, there's a really interesting article I was talking about this morning. Is it Winter's Panel? Winter Panel. Winter Panel in Brattleboro, who, who is a new home company called Unity Homes, producing a very high-tech kind of affordable, sustainable home. Okay? And that requires, and it involves a company out of New Hampshire, uh, Benson, Woods. Benson Woods. Okay, so the, that's an example where you're taking old timber examples and <laughs> applying CAD CAM technology to create a whole new way to build homes in a sustainable way. That's value added. Okay, and that's getting close to the seat. Does that? Yeah, I think this is all really fascinating and I'm really excited about it. And I, I'm just wondering about the folks that are within our community already who are unemployed, who are not going to be, who don't have the skills or the education for the types of positions you're talking about, mm -hmm. and if that's going to be part of the conversation as well. Absolutely, because those, those are people that can act, act, if you can figure out what their skills are and what their innate capabilities are, they have the opportunity to, uh, uh, Pat is one of the major focuses of SEBA is this around workforce development. Mm -hmm. So that's looking at the whole issue around where, because we don't have enough workforce in this region, which I'll show Yes, ma'am. We have a, a small kind of mom and pop business that's grown. It's been um, in business since the turn of the century. And so we had 13 greenhouses that um, kind of never were a really able to grow. So we're kind of a business that is keeping the pool a little even. So okay. we kind of have our retail business that exports a lot, but then we've started a small specialty um, food. Well, we import a lot, I'm sorry, for our retail store, but we have a specialty food business that's allowed us to kind of grow out of the pool and export. So it's kind of been able to prop up that local Good. business, create more jobs, um, you know, just kind of out of necessity of right. surviving in a town where the economy doesn't really grow. Right. Okay. And what's the name of the company? Halliday's. Halliday's? Halliday's. Okay. Great.